my name is Paula. I'm with the BC Community Bat Program in the Okanagan region and I'm based here right out of Penticton. Today I'm here to talk to you about bats. Uh, bats are really interesting. Uh, they, uh, first of all, bats are mammals. Uh, so bats, what, what is a mammal? A mammal is an animal that has fur, such as these little guys here. These are live bat, well not, they're dead bats. And uh, bats or mammals also give birth to live young. So this is a baby bat. Uh, as you can see with this photo, bats are really tiny when they're born. They're about the size of my nail. Uh, they are born without fur, uh, but the fur sir, soon comes, they, the, soon, the fur soon grows in. Um, in a few days uh, and they learn to fly when they're about three to six weeks old depending on the bat species. So we were talking about mammals, bats give birth to live young that also suckle milk. So bats live in maternity roosts where all the females come together to, into one place uh, and they live together and give birth to their live young and they help each other raise the young. The males do not partake in the raising of the young. So how many of you guys have seen bats? Uh, probably not many of you. Bats are nocturnal, <coughs> excuse me, and that means that they are active at night. If you're really keen to see a bat, uh, maybe try staying up late one night, going outside, starting at sunset. Uh, and uh, see if you can see any flying around. A great place to see them is near the lake because the first thing that bats do when they wake up is they head for water to get a drink. And bats, amazingly, when they need a drink, they fly along and they actually will land in the water, not land, but they'll skim the water, lap up the water, and then fly away. Uh, so they don't actually need to land in order to get a drink of water. Another great place to go look at bats is at Sonoka Provincial Park. If you go there right around sunset in the summer, uh, there's a few bat boxes that are there with bat, with bat colonies that live there, uh, and it's a great place to, to, to go see them. So bats are also interesting because they're the only mammal that can fly, that can truly fly. There's uh, flying foxes, or flying, so not flying foxes, flying squirrels that some people think can fly, but flying squirrels actually only glide from up high to down low. Bats are the only mammal that can truly fly. They have amazing wings, as you can see in this photo, bats, or in this uh, model, uh, bats, their, their bones are actually part of their wing. So this is the elbow joint, the forearm, and then we have their little thumb and their four fingers. And because of that, bats are incredibly agile at flying. They also, when they land, they, they land with their thumb when they're landing on a, on a surface, and then they'll crawl up. Uh, a lot of people think that bats will do damage on a house. If, if you have a colony that's living in your house, they think that they're going to scratch and they're going to bite. Uh, but bats can't do that because they don't have four feet like mice and rats do, so they can't scratch. They only have a little thumb to be able to hang on. Uh, and also their teeth. Bats have really tiny teeth because they eat insects. And they don't eat wood or plant material like rodents do. So uh, bats have really tiny pointy teeth that will crush the exoskeleton of, of an insect. So for example, think of a beetle and how hard the shell is. They can crush the shell. Uh, but they don't have the two front teeth of a beaver or a rodent like a mouse to chew the wood. So they will not damage uh, your house by trying to get in by chewing the wood. Uh, they'll just take opportunity if there is some disrepair in your house and there's cracks, 
uh, or, or what have you in the house, or, or maybe a woodpecker came along and made a hole, they will crawl in there. Uh, but they won't damage your house by chewing on it. So here's another really good uh, photo of, of uh, anatomy of a wing. Uh, and if you can see, there's a human, a bird, and a bat. And these are the bones. So you can see again how the finger bones have extended. And because of that, bats are, part, are uh, classified as the order Choroptera. So bats uh, are not part of the part of the order Rodentia, which are the rodents. They have their own their own order called Choroptera, which means hand wing, as you can see here. So many of you might be wondering, well, where do bats live? And bats uh, here in the Penticton area live in natural areas, so they need uh, trees like riparian areas near the lake, uh, or they need uh, forests or grasslands, uh, or they need the mountains as we have them on either side. Rocky areas like Skaha Bluffs are really popular for bats. Uh, bats also need uh, food, and bats in the Okanagan, actually in all of Canada, eat only insects. We have 14 different species of bats in the Okanagan. And here's a list. The only one in this list that we don't have is the northern, um, northern myotis. The rest of them we do. Oh, Mexican free tail we don't either. Uh, but the rest of them we do have here in the Okanagan. And all of these bats eat only insects. Uh, and arthropods, arthropods being, or, or pardon me, arachnids, which are insect, uh, which are spiders. Uh, so the really interesting thing about the Okanagan and the Penticton area is that we have two species of bats that don't occur anywhere else in, uh, in BC, and that's the spotted bat and the pallid bat. The pallid bat only occurs in desert dry areas such as our ecosystems here in the, in the Penticton area. We also have the spotted bat, and the spotted bat is really interesting. Let's see if I have a photo of it here. This is the spotted bat here. He's black and white, has really big ears, um, and he has sort of the white spots on his back that are white. Um, the spotted bat is one of the only bats in the area whose echolocation calls you can hear at night. So bats echolocate at night, which means that they use sort of like a radar uh, to be able to hunt insects at night. They emit a really high-pitched noise that we cannot hear. However, we can hear the spotted bats calls. The way echolocation works is we could pretend that these are the sound waves coming out of, of me if I'm a bat. Um, they would come out, so it would be like echo, 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 and then they would hit something like a wall. The, the echo would bounce back saying wall, 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 and the bat hears the wall and says, oh, I can't fly that way because I'm going to hit the wall, so he's going to fly over here. And then he goes, okay, echo, 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 and he hits, say he hits a mosquito. The mosquito comes back going, mosquito, 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 mosquito. Oh, there's a mosquito over there. And then the bat will fly towards the mosquito by increasing the amount of echoes that it, or of um, noise or high pitched noise that it sends out so that it can hear where the mosquito is and be able to hunt it down and eat it. So the other thing that bats need is water. And here in the Penticton area, we are surrounded by two lakes, so they have lots of water in order um, to stay alive. Uh, and the other amazing thing about bats is that they actually drink while they fly. So if here's my bat and here's my water surface, bats will fly along and they will drink while they fly and then fly up. Uh, and so one of the things, if you want to have a look at some bats, uh, go in the evening to the lake front and uh, keep an eye out because sometimes you'll be able to see bats. And now I'm going to talk to you about why bats are important. 
Bats eat millions of insects that are considered to be pests to both ourselves and also the agricultural and forestry uh, industries. Uh, so bats eat a lot of insects. Uh, most people know that bats eat mosquitoes, uh, but did you know that they also eat a lot of moths uh, and also beetles? Uh, for example, they eat cucumber beetles, so a lot of the local uh, farms really benefit from having bats in the area. Uh, they also eat leaf hoppers, which also will eat some crops or damage them. Um, and this is a June beetle, uh, which also the bats love to eat. Uh, in general, uh, bats, they did a, la a lab study and they found that a bat could eat 600 mosquitoes in one hour in a research lab setting. In general, a lactating female, so that means a female that has a pup and lives in a maternity colony, it can eat her body weight in mosquitoes, or not mosquitoes, in insects, each night. So that's a lot of insects that each bat will eat. Uh, if you have a colony of, say, 100 bats, then that's 100 times that many insects, right? Uh, and usually, so for example, the Peachland, uh, the Peachland Visitor Center, I don't know if any of you have been there, it's pretty close to Penticton, just north of here. It has a colony of little brown bats and Yuma bats that live in the attic. They have between 1,000 and 2,000 bats that live in the attic, and they eat thousands and thousands of mosquitoes every night. So this is a po photo of the Peachland Visitor Center attic, the maternity roost that lives there. Uh, so these are all females. They give birth to one pup per year, and about half of those pups make it through their first winter. So bats, that's one of the reasons why bats are also in trouble, is because they don't reproduce very quickly. All right, so we were, we were talking about bats being important. They do eat millions and millions of insects every summer. We get the bats arrive usually in, in the Penticton area uh, around late March, beginning of April, and they stay all summer until about August, September is when they leave. So all of that time, spring and summer, excuse me, and part of fall, they will be eating lots and lots of insects in the area. Um, one of the other reasons that bats are, are important is that uh, their guano, which is their poop, is actually really important. Uh, just like, um, I don't know if you guys have heard that grizzly bears and the, and the whole fish and salmon uh, system are very connected in that when the bears come down to eat the salmon as they're migrating up in, in the river and then they eat the, the fish and they take them up, up slope and poop in the forest, they're recycling the nutrients that way, so do the bats. So the bats come down to the lakefront or to the wetland areas, they eat all the insects as they're emerging from the water, uh, as they're hatching, uh, and then they go up, up the mountain or up the slope a little bit or into the grasslands or the forests, and then that's often where they, where they will go to the bathroom when they get to their roosts. And so bat guano is full of nutrients. It's insects that have been chewed up, a lot of people will, that have bat uh, colonies will actually use the bat guano, they'll collect it and they'll put it in their flower beds. And it's full of nutrients in some places in the world, like I think in the States, not here in Canada, you can buy bat guano at garden stores as fertilizer to put it in your garden uh, beds. So that's another reason why bats are important. Their bat guano is full of nutrients. Okay, in other parts of the world, uh, we have fruit bats, and uh, we don't have those here in the Penticton area, but bats in other areas are also really important because they eat fruit. So they're pollinator bats, uh, they pollinate flowers just like bees do. 
they go up to a flower, they take some of the nectar, um, and in doing so they collect the pollen, then they go to another banana flower and they pollinate the bananas, which is amazing. Uh, they also disperse seeds, those fruit bats, because they will eat the fruit and then they'll fly away somewhere else and then they'll poop and the seed of that fruit tree will be placed somewhere and grow. And amazingly enough, uh, most of you I'm sure have heard of vampire bats. Uh, vampire bats will, uh, there's only two species of vampire bats in the whole world out of over a thousand species of bats. And those vampire bats, when they bite, not like in the movies where the vampires will chew your, your throat and, and suck your blood out. Uh, no, vampire bats are actually quite, quite small. I don't have a photo, unfortunately, but what they do is they go up to uh, say, say this is the paw of a chicken that is sleeping at night. Um, the bat will come up, they will make a little, um, a little cut on their feet, and then they'll actually lap up the blood as it comes out. And the reason that the blood keeps coming out is that vampire bats have an anticoagulant in their saliva. And so when they make that little slice on the, on the chicken's leg, um, they, the anti anticoagulant will let the blood run. And so incredibly, vampire bat saliva has actually been discovered and made into anticoagulant pills for people that have heart issues. So um, thank you, vampire bats, for your saliva. Okay, and then lastly, another amazing part, reason why bats are uh, really important is that they're a really integral part of our culture. So how many of you guys like Halloween? Uh, bats are amazing as part of our culture in Halloween. Uh, they also are part of our movies. Uh, so anything from uh, the Count from Sesame Street to uh, Edward Cullen in the Twilight series to uh, Batman, so popular, to I'm sure there's lots, <laughs> the vampire, the vampire series, all the vampire horror movies. Uh, bats have always been part of our culture and they are super important for that reason as well. Okay, so now I'm going to talk to you about why bats are in trouble. We know that bats are really interesting, we know that bats are really important, uh, but unfortunately they are in trouble. Seven out of our 15, 14 species that we have in the Okanagan are uh, at risk. Uh, two, one of them, the little brown bat, is listed as endangered uh, under the Species at Risk Act. Uh, and this is very sad. Uh, bats are so important and we'd hate to lose them. So why are they in trouble? Uh, one of the main, main uh, reasons is because of loss of habitat. So over time, uh, think about uh, uh, Penticton itself. It used to be uh, a big river that connected Okanagan Lake and South Okanagan Lake with all these beautiful big cottonwood trees as the, as the river meandered from one lake to another. And over the last century, we've, we've taken all those trees down, we've channelized the river, uh, and uh, as a result, dramatically changed the landscape. All of that natural habitat has been taken away, uh, and bats no longer have trees to roost in, or, uh, or uh, places to, uh, to forage and hunt for insects. Uh, so another thing that has been lost is the antelope brush uh, ecosystems that are on either side. So one of the amazing things about the Okanagan is that we have a very dry ecosystem and thus we have two species of bats, the pallid bat right here uh, this is the pallid bat is one of the only uh, bats that will actually glean the ground for in, for insects, and they do eat spiders, arachnids, uh, and even scorpions. Uh, in the South Okanagan, down in the Osoyoos area, they've been spotted eating scorpions. Uh, so really amazing uh, bats, very unique uh, for the dry landscapes that we have here. 
And then the other species that we have uh, is the spotted bat, which is the one that I was mentioning earlier with the big ears, that uh, this bat whose echolocation calls we can hear. So the antelope brush ecosystems where these two bats live is being also developed, destroyed, uh, and uh, hopefully some of it will be conserved. Uh, but uh, one of, that's loss of habitat, big, big thing that's happening uh, that is uh, unfortunately impacting bats a lot. The other reason is that as these changes happened, uh, people a long time ago in, uh, installed big barns uh, or old buildings and the bats moved into them instead of having their natural habitat. Uh, and they, they adapted, they were able to live in those buildings, uh, but now a lot of those old structures, old barns are being torn down. And so we're finding that, again, they're facing this, this, uh, this onslaught of destruction. Uh, and uh, so if you, have, if you have a property and you have an old barn, uh, make sure you do uh, either contact the BC Community Bat Program to see if we can come out and see if you have bats uh, and maybe we can help uh, figure out how to relo relocate them or, or if possible, the best solution is to keep the barn uh, so that they, they can stay uh, using it. Uh, and of course, they also use uh, current buildings, a lot of the new developments uh, that use big wooden beams or stucco, uh, they're, they're kind of like giant trees and so the bats are now using those buildings and uh, it's important for people to, to understand that, that bats are important and interesting and part of our communities and uh, if we can learn how to coexist with bats that are using our buildings, uh, then it's all the better for the bats and for, for the ecosystems and ourselves as well. Uh, the other thing that is impacting bats, which is surprising, is actually wind turbines. Uh, here we are thinking we're, we're, we're working towards more sustainable energy production and wind turbines are actually detrimental to bats. Uh, researchers are finding that there's a lot of mortality associated with the wind turbines, uh, both birds and, and bats, as they fly through in their migration, they get killed in these sites. So something that is being worked on to try and um, figure out how to, how to get the bats to, to not be attracted to the wind turbines. And then most pressingly uh, is a disease that has been introduced to North America, Eastern North America, called white nose syndrome. And white nose syndrome is, called, is caused by a fungus that attacks the bats or grows on the bats when they're hibernating. So in winter, uh, we have what, 14 species of bats here. Uh, three of those bats migrate south to warmer climates so that they can keep hunting insects all winter, but the rest of our bat species go up into the hills and hibernate in either caves, old mine shafts, uh, or deep cracks in the rocks, like for example, Skaha Bluffs, again, I always refer to that one just because we know that there's lots of bats there, uh, and they hibernate, they go into a deep state of, uh, of um, sleeping without waking up to, to, to need to go eat. Okay, so we've talked about why bats are super interesting and we've talked about why bats are important, mostly as they eat so many insects in uh, the Okanagan area. And we've talked about why bats are in trouble. Uh, but I don't want to leave you with a negative message, so I'm going to leave you with a message of hope. Uh, and I want you to know that you can do a lot of things to help bats. So first of all, let's talk about white nose syndrome and how you can get involved in helping uh, our bat population. So researchers in the area are keeping an eye out for white nose syndrome, the disease and uh, the fungus itself. And so if you see any dead bats uh, all through winter right up to the end of May, uh, we would love to hear about it. So please call us uh, or contact the BC Community Bat Program 
www.bcbats.ca and uh, let us know that you have found a dead bat. Uh, please do not touch bats, even if they're dead or alive, make sure you wear gloves. Uh, bats are generally safe to handle, however, uh, less than 0.5% of bats do carry rabies. Uh, rabies is a very serious disease, so we all take precautions to make sure that we don't get bit. You can get bait rabies by getting bit by a bat uh, or by having saliva uh, contact uh, if you have a cut or anything like that. Uh, so most biologists that work with bats have their rabies shots uh, and most of the general population do not have rabies shots. So make sure that you do not handle bats and please teach your kids not to handle bats as well. They are wild animals even though they're cute and furry. Or I think they're cute and furry. <laughs> uh, okay, so report dead bats and also report winter bat activity. So if you see any bats uh, flying around, especially during the day, that's really odd behavior. Bats should be sleeping during the day. So if you see any, any bats flying around, please give us a call as well to report it. Just let us know where it was, what time of the day, uh, and the date. It would be great. Uh, and then on a bigger picture for white nose syndrome, if you have a bat colony that roosts in your building, on the outside of your house, or at your barn, or in your shed, or maybe you've installed a bat box and it's active and uh, bats use it during the summer, uh, we would love to, get a, uh, to have your help. Uh, so just contact us. Again, www.bcbats.ca or send me an email, okanaganbats at gmail.com. And uh, let me know that you have a bat colony and you want to help with white nose syndrome monitoring. The way to do that is pretty easy. You just have to um, clean out the floor. So say this is the floor under the bat box or under the side of the house where you find bat guano often accumulated. Uh, you just need to clean it out so that it's all a fresh slate. You can lay out some plastic or some mesh or some tin to be able to collect the fresh guano as it falls when bats first arrive um, from hibernation. Uh, so the idea is you, you set it down, you clean out your surface and then you just keep checking it about once a week starting now because bats, uh, we've already had our first sighting of our spring bat that has returned. Uh, so you just keep checking for guano signs. As soon as you see some pellets on the ground, then that means the bats are back. And you start, uh, you measure or you count uh, four weeks after you see the first signs of bat guano on the ground. You let the bat guano accumulate and after a month you collect a cup of it and we can get you signed up. We'll, signed you a, we'll send you a collection kit so that you can collect the guano and send it in for testing. And the idea is that uh, the bats will have been cleaning themselves and if they have the fungus on their nose or their wings, they will be ingesting it because they're cleaning themselves and then they poop it out <laughs> and then we can find the spores of the fungus in their guano and thus we will know if the fungus has arrived to the Penticton area or not. Hopefully not for a while. There are many other ways that you can help bats. You can, uh, if you have bats living in your building, there's, we have lots of uh, information that you can find on our website on how to coexist with bats, how to manage bats, uh, but before you manage them, first you have to assess uh, your building if you, if you do have bats. Uh, we have many homeowners who have bats living on the outside of their building and that's perfectly okay. Uh, there's nothing that, uh, that indicates that, that bats are, uh, are disease ridden that are going to you know, be bad for us or anything like that. Um, bats are actually one of the most common wildlife, spe wildlife that we have that we coexist with, uh, much like deer that walk around. Our neighborhoods or um, birds that come to our feeder. So no need to be afraid of bats, uh, we just need to understand them so that we're not afraid of them. <laughs>